it's Jen and Danielle, and we're here to talk about real estate. They're also typing letters, mm -hmm. love letters to the sellers, right? And you know what? I, I know we've kind of talked about that, and I'm kind of indifferent at the moment if they're a good thing to have or not. But I've seen a lot of comments that they won't even look, look at, at it. And I had a, a listing not that long ago that had several offers and a lot of them had letters. And it's like, I don't, I gave, I gave my clients the option. Do you want to read them? And they're like, no, we better not. And we waited until they picked one and then they read that one. They didn't read any of the other ones because some of those can really like. If you have a seller, and this is what I tell my buyers. If you have a seller that is emotionally attached to their home, which we all know most people buy on emotion, unless mm -hmm. it's an investor, like I said, mm -hmm. unless it's an investor that's selling. If they've lived in their home a long time and they've made a lot of memories there, a lot of times they can be emotionally connected to their home. So in their heart, they want it to go to another family someone or that's gonna take care some, of yeah, someone yes. that's going to take good care of it and that loves it and there's going to be a lot of love in the home. I purposely never even look at the buyer's names on the purchase agreement. And I had a situation arise where I presented multiple offers. My seller was at a state, so I presented the multiple offers over the phone and she went with a particular offer. Again, never disclose the buyer's names because like I tell my sellers when we're signing on the listing contract, we don't care if a purple people eater buys your home as long as they qualify for it. We don't care anything about their background, right? We don't, as long as they're qualified to buy your home, you can't discriminate. You can't discriminate about so many different things that you know that's a whole nother video that we would have to talk about okay. so as a listing agent i never tell them the buyer's name well once she got the purchase agreement to sign it she then googled the buyer and found out who this particular buyer was and we had some issues with that so my point is to protect yourself and to protect myself mm -hmm. i typically do not ever look up the buyer now sometimes you've got buyers that before they even go look at a home, they're already on Facebook, finding out who the seller is and finding out all the information on the seller. I also don't do that. I don't have the time to do that, but some of my clients do. And the reality of it is everyone's looking up everybody. People are probably looking up me on Facebook, trying to see, you know, how many kids do I have? Where do I live? You know, all that kind of stuff. Just to, they want to try to get some type of edge. Mm -hmm. You know, where can they pull a little leverage from? Right. Because buyers get desperate. Mm -hmm. They sure do. They sure do. All right, back to this purchase agreement. Yes, we've had a, we have a few pages of. We haven't had any chips yet. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Check the counter. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've got your mortgage pages. Then we've got this portion: sellers' contributions to buyers' costs, closing costs. Right? Who's gonna buy them? Or who's gonna who's gonna, who's gonna buy them? Who's so, gonna pay them? When it was more of a buyer's market. So, list sellers were willing to pay a part of the portion of the buyer's closing costs. So there's a portion in the purchase agreement where the seller is contributing or is not contributing to the buyer's closing costs and how much is that? Typically they can, depending on the mortgage you're getting, contribute up to 3% mm -hmm. of the purchase price. So that is less money that the buyer then needs to bring to closing because buyers nowadays need to have a down payment and money for closing costs right so there's a portion in here to ask the seller to pay that for you sellers really care about their net offer okay but a good list listing agent is going to be concerned that if you want to offer 250 but you offer 258 and then ask the seller to pay 200 or 8,000 of your closing costs that's a net of 250 yep so the so seller watch. really cares more about their net you know what is the net offer but a good listing agent's going to say but if you inflate that price to 258, it now needs to appraise for 258, mm -hmm. not 250. And if you're concerned about inflating that price too much, you've already got multiple offers. Now you got someone else offering even higher because they're asking for you to pay their closing costs. That gets to be a little dicey. And as mm -hmm. a listing agent, I'm concerned about that because I know by the time it gets to that point, a seller sometimes gets be stuck between a rock and a hard place because you're just a few weeks out from closing possibly yeah. and now you got a little appraisal so do you renegotiate the sale price because you're so close to the finish line mm -hmm. or do you say you know what 
no, I'm not going that low. I'll put my house back on the market. Mm -hmm. Well, are you in the same market you were before? Yeah. Is your house still in showing condition? Is it worth that? Would you rather just take the hit on your sell price and close in a few weeks? It. it depends on your seller situation. But I'm just saying that that can happen and then you have to renegotiate it unless you have buyers that are also saying, you know what? Even if the appraisal comes in low, I'm still moving forward and I will pay the difference. I've got the money to do it. You check with their lender and make sure they're telling the truth, mm -hmm. but they'll put right in the purchase agreement that they will pay any gap on the appraisal up to typically an X amount. Did you know I had never seen that until these last couple of years? Or I've never, not to say I haven't seen it, but I had never been in that situation with clients mm -hmm. having an appraisal gap. Just like like if I it said, doesn't appraise, it doesn't appraise. Buyers are getting, and buyers agents mm -hmm. are getting very creative on ways that they can look appealing. You know what, we're offering you 30 grand more. Don't even worry about the appraisal because if it comes in low, we're still paying for it no matter what. Mm -hmm. People are doing that too. So as a buyer, don't even think about offering contingent on the sale of your home right now. No. What? No. Mm -mm. No. If you're going to be buying you and you need to sell your house first, you do that sell first. It. Yep. And we help you navigate that because then the question becomes, do you put your home on the market, get your money so you know how much money you have, then you can figure out how much money buying power you have. Then you got to do a double move or maybe a rent back. Mm -hmm. Are your buyers going to let you rent in your home for a month while you find another house? You've closed, now you got your money. There's different ways that we can do it. There is. There's and it depends on your specific situation. Mm -hmm. And it's either going to open more doors for you and give you more purchase power. Otherwise, if you say, nope, I can't do a double move, but I got to sell my house first, then you know what? We do double closings and we, we navigate through it and it just, it's it's not something that can't be anything can be done right just can take time sometimes and every situation is unique but it's not a situation that danielle or i probably have never been in before right. probably is unique to you because you don't buy and sell houses every day right. maybe the last time you bought was 10 15 years ago and times were different. maybe even 30 40 years ago we weren't your realtor then no but we still know how to do it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's right all right Inspections, we talked about that. You yep. can either elect to have one or decline to have one, have a contingent on it or not. We talked about the sale of the buyer's property. That's this other section. Real estate taxes, we don't really have to talk about too no, much, but most that's of it's just, usually, you know. We usually prorate, so pro -rate. seller pays up until the day closing and then you take over on your taxes. We usually ask them to pay any real estate taxes they haven't paid if they're deferring or behind on it. We ask yep. the seller pay okay, that. Yep. Yeah, the rest of this. Just Possession. Down. It's going to oh, ask yeah. you, when do you want to take occupancy of the home? Typically, it's immediately. I want to close at 10 o'clock, and right after the closing, I want the keys, and I'm going to move into my house. Mm -hmm. However, you touched on this briefly. Yes, in today's market, you might say, you know what? I'm going to give you 48 hours to get out of your home so that you can close on this house, finish moving out into your new home, then I'll move in. You don't have to have everything packed up and cleaned out at the moment of closing, I'll give you 48 hours to finish packing and move out. Or, I mean, anything's negotiable. You could do 72 hours, you could do 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Back in the day when I first started, it was 24 to 48 hours was pretty standard. Then it turned into a seller's market, and or a buyer's market, and it was, nope, I want immediate possession. And that's kind of stuck. But I'm mm -hmm. seeing more realtors say, you know, sellers prefer a 48 hour or 72 hour possession time. Because they can. Sellers are in the driver's seat right now. Yeah. That they are. I feel like that could be a whole whole different video. Seller's disclosures. Seller's disclosures. You have to fill out a form, several pages of things to know about the house that you're selling. Have you done any updates? Mm -hmm. Does all your plumbing work? Does all your electrical work? Have you done, you know, have you pulled any permits? Are they closed? Is there a, a leak? Yeah. In the basement. Have you ever Did had you a, a leak in your roof? Water in your basement? What happened? What did you do to remediate that? Mm -hmm. How long ago was it? What did you do? Do you still have problems with it? Sellers need to fill all of that out, and then buyers, you have the chance to review all of that. So, and it says right on the purchase agreement whether you reviewed it or not. Correct. And if you have a well or a septic, there's a whole nother disclosure for that. There's forms upon forms upon forms for just about everything. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important that, you know, most of us now are using um, electronic signatures. So, we're going to hit the highlights with you. 
about what you want to offer. We're gonna fill this out, we're gonna send it to you and we're gonna say, call me if you have any questions. And I would say 98% of the time, nobody ever calls and asks me questions and they Very sign good. it. But it's extremely important that we go through this purchase agreement and answer any questions or tell you everything that we're talking about now mm -hmm. so that you know how to plan and what to move forward with. Right. And don't ever be afraid to ask questions on a specific scenario. Yeah. I actually like to give my clients a copy of the purchase agreement blank ahead of time so they know, like, okay, if we have to move quick, this is what we're going to be filling yeah. out. I'll go through all of this with you, but look it over ahead of time and if there's any questions. I'm right kind of jealous of new agents now because back in the day when I got my license, everything was done um, in person on carbon paper and then you would go present things in person and then we got what was called a fax machine and we could fax it and then you weren't meeting the other clients in person. But I was still sitting at a table filling out the purchase agreement with my clients and then they would sign it and I could explain the purchase agreement as we went along and filled it out and had them sign it. I would say, I'm gonna go start the purchase agreement, go get something to eat, come meet me at the office in 20 minutes. And that way by the time they got there, I'd have most of it filled out and then I would go through it with them and have them sign it. Well, new agents nowadays just get to go on and type up the purchase agreement and hit send and have them sign it. And they never even have to go through the purchase agreement. I mean. You should be sweating your first few, sweating, flumbling over your words trying to explain this to somebody and be nervous about it. They don't mm -hmm. even have to be nervous about it anymore because they're just behind a computer screen and then their clients just sign it and they you have no idea. dating yourself. Well, yes. But actually when I started, it was, there was probably my first couple transactions. You didn't have authentic sign, did you? No. That was new because I think I had like one or two deals and I was like, okay. I got this and then they changed it I was like oh, I don't got it again like, yeah. <laughs> gotta figure it I out I mean I remember full out panic of oh my god they want to write this offer okay just give me some time and I was very young yes you were baby. so I was very scared but all right it ended up being all right it did okay. I'm not scared Look anymore mm -hmm. I think we hit on pretty much everything we need to talk about and yes. if the people are still watching, God bless you. You know what? We're going to do one more video someday, and we're going to do it on disclosures because there's a whole thing about seller's disclosures and what to disclose, and then there's this thing called arbitration disclosures. Oh, uh, don't get me started. Do I sign it? Do I not sign it? It's optional. Oh, that's a whole nother video. All right. Until next time. We'll see you later. I almost said we'll see you there. See we'll you see him where. I don't know. Oh, 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 oh,